Hello from Bloomberg's European headquarters in London. My name is David Merritt, and it's my real pleasure to be hosting this conversation today on this vitally important question of how we accelerate the diversity of our company boards. And I'm joined by three speakers who are not only experts in this field, but I think I'm right in saying real pioneers. We have Baroness Morrissey. She's the founder of the 30% Club and chair of the Diversity Project that works to improve diversity throughout the investment industry. Esther Aguilera is the Chief Executive Officer of the Latino Corporate Directors Association. And Darren Walker is the President of the Ford Foundation and a partner with the Board Diversity Action Alliance. So our task over the next uh, 25 minutes or so is to explore the next frontiers in the push for board diversity. And without doubt, there's been great progress on this subject in recent years, making company boards look a bit more like the world around them. But of course, there's still so much more to do. So I want to start with you, um, Helena Morrissey. When you started the 30% Club, it was to tackle primarily this glaring lack of female representation on boards. And at least here in the UK, you could argue that that job uh, has been done. The target is met or in many cases exceeded. Uh, there are no 50, 100 companies left without female representation. So before we talk about what's next, just quite simply, could you tell us how you did it? Well, thanks, David. I have to say quite a lot of um, luck was involved. And perhaps as I look back now, I think that there were some success factors that came together that we weren't really aware of at the time. And one was definitely the zeitgeist. There was this um, sort of burning platform after the financial crisis. Uh, it was obvious then Nobody could argue that the boards needed to change, management companies needed to change, there needed to be more challenge. And this was a real moment to seize. And it might be something we want to explore later about whether at the same juncture around race now. But it was it meant that there was a great sort of push from the public publicity, the media, the government support was all behind, and that was critical. Secondly, we involved men. And it might seem a bit strange to credit men with sort of a women's progress, um, but it was a partnership. We, I realized that women talking to women about women's issues wasn't going to get us as far as having really powerful allies. And those men that we engaged on it were really powerful men. They were chairman of the board. And that was a really critical um, success factor as well. Then I'd say a public and private sector partnership was the third most important factor. And in the UK, we were lucky because not only was there this um, private sector initiative, the 30% Club, which was sort of about voluntary change by businesses, but a huge public support from it in the shape of the government review led by Lord Dave um, in why there were so few women on boards. And it ended up being a great, I don't know if I can use the expression, tag team, if you like, between um, the government and, uh, you know, decreeing in a way as best it could the things needed to change. And then businesses under the auspices of the 30% Club saying, OK, we'll do that. So it wasn't necessarily thought out like that, but with hindsight, that's what happened. So you mentioned the zeitgeist and, and alluded to this as well about what might be the next frontier. And of course, the last year is extraordinary for so many reasons, but it was the outpouring of grief and anger around the murder of George Floyd last summer that made people around the world and companies as well wake up to this problem of racial inequality and crucially, I think, commit to changing. So perhaps, Esther Aguilera, do you think attitudes to race within corporate culture and on companies' boards have actually shifted in the past year? Well, David, we still have a long way to go in the U.S. Uh, to diversify boards. Um, just as an example, Latinos are being left out. In fact, this month, Russell Reynolds is reporting that 87% of all public company seats are held by uh, whites. Uh, so all public company directors are white, and Latinos hold a mere 2.2% of those seats, even though we're 2 in 10 Americans. Now, why does this matter? Uh, U.S. boardrooms are dangerously disconnected from the diverse marketplace, and that can result in a loss of market share, uh, it can result in missed market opportunity and can compromise corporate culture. So there is room for us all at the table. Darren Walker, you wrote in a piece in Time magazine uh, last year about what companies can do to tackle racial inequality. And your number one recommendation was to remake the C-suite. Is that happening? It's not happening at the pace that it should. And I think Esther is right. The numbers uh, are woefully 
uh, appalling, actually. And we have much room to, uh, and much progress that we need to make. I think this is not about doing a favor for women, people of color. This is about EPS. This is about higher EBITDA. This is uh, about business, because we know from the research and the evidence that companies that are more diverse are more profitable. They are more sustainable. They have higher engagement satisfaction from employees. So the data, the evidence, is what is actually driving my passion around this. Of course, diversity, equity, inclusion in a democracy, a multiracial democracy, a nation with democratic capitalism, representation does matter. The C-suite is not a place where you see broad representation, and that needs to change. I think, David, we did see in the wake of the murders some remarkable performative acts by CEOs. I think we should revisit on the occasion of the anniversary, the one-year anniversary, and see if the S&P is a more diverse place. Uh, upon the, 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 the murder of George Floyd and the racial reckoning in America, we realized that one-third of the S&P did not have an African-American director. Um, and so let's see where the numbers are. Let's see how many add Latinx, how many add African-American, how many add women, women of color, who are woefully underrepresented. Uh, and yet there is so much talent. There are so many people who are prepared to serve, but who have not been asked. You mentioned the data there, and I think it is clear, isn't it, the outperformance of companies that have truly diverse boards and embrace this agenda. What then is holding companies back in making these appointments? You mentioned, Darren, that there are other people out there. Helena, what is stopping, particularly with the, uh, the fo your focus on the investment industry? You think they would see it more clearly, perhaps, the investment case for this. Why are the numbers still so bad? Well, I, um, it's quite a complicated picture because often this reflects societal issues. Um, it's not just the boardroom where obviously there isn't fair representation of different groups, but um, throughout lots of leadership roles. Um, unfortunately, for, for many years, decades, centuries even, uh, one sort of narrow band of people has tended to um, have all the senior leadership roles. And I do think change can happen more quickly if we get the formula right, as, as I say, um, which we've uh, happened upon in the UK with the women on boards. But I feel at the moment um, that there is more commitment to this issue than ever before. I think um, partly because of the financial uh, case that you've made, but also I think there's such a big understanding that clients, particularly the next generation of consumers, they expect their com the companies that they buy products from, that they buy services from, to be like them, to understand their issues. Um, and I do think that's something that is is bearing down on I would just mention very quickly on the investor community, one of the problems there, of course, is the investors' um, investment management industry is not that diverse itself at the top. And so although they've been pushing investee companies to do more, it's a little bit tricky and there's a, there's a need for our own house in order, at least concurrently. I do think That's that the, the challenge, number. though, in fairness, is it's, um, it's not that complicated. This is about privilege, incumbency, and power. And it has historically rested with, as Elena says, a narrow band of primarily white men. And this is not a knock against white men. We have to understand that this is pro-excellence. This is pro-profitability. And what the barrier is, is that it will require new behavior and change by a population who doesn't particularly like to be told what to do. And, and this is why we see the uh, resistance to the NASDAQ rule uh, by some. This is why we see the, uh, the yells of reverse discrimination 
and some of these pernicious things that are being said, when fairness is uh, projected, powerful, insulated, privileged interests feel that fairness to them feels like oppression. Fairness feels unfair um, when you speak from a position of privilege. And so we have to call this what it is. This is not that complicated. This is about power, privilege, and incumbency. And so how do I we would talk add, open that privilege? Would, Esther, sorry, yes. Sure. No, I would add uh, exactly uh, along the lines that Darren is uh, mentioning is that, look, there is ample talent. When the NASDAQ rule was presented, one of the criticisms was, well, well, there can't, cannot possibly be ample source of Latino and Black talent for the boardroom. And in fact, there is. I think that is, we have to put not only that behind us, but there are organizations now that weren't there in the past that are here to be part of the solution. Um, the membership of the Latino Corporate Directors Association is made up of some of the most respected and accomplished leaders in business. So there is ample talent and there are some actions that board chairs and non-gov chairs can take. You can have a more proactive outreach and broaden your own network. Treat a, a board seat like you would succession planning in that you want to start to get to know a broader swath of phenomenal diverse talent even before you have the vacancy. Also, you know, we have a large number of boards that are all white in the U.S. If that's the case, have a search of only diverse talent. You're going to find phenomenal people if you take some very, very basic steps. Just the what we're talking about here is how hard it is to crack this privilege um, that has a grip, it seems, on these boards. You know, the fact that you have so many all-white boards in the U.S. And of course, the Nasdaq rule, uh, by its nature, stock exchanges are only going to reach a limited number of companies. So my question really is about the role of government. Does there need to be more drastic action taken at a governmental level to crack open the access to these? Boards uh, here in the UK, obviously, things like transparency reporting has had a big impact, I think, on on uh, on attitudes. But do we need to go down the route more of actual quotas for companies across the board, not just ones listed on Nasdaq? Well, I do think Maybe there has is a role. Hmm. I think there is a role for the SEC. I think there is a role um, at the state level, as we have seen in the state of California. Uh, I would wish that we would not need regulation in this regard. I would wish that uh, boards of their own druthers would see the value, um, but I think it is going to require some regulation by either uh, the SEC or by uh, the listing exchange. Um, but you're right, David. I mean, the thing that we are talking about is private equity and all of the private companies uh, that uh, for which there is very little transparency. Um, and very little knowledge about what the real data are. So Transparency can, does seem to, yes, Helena. I was just going to add, um, so I have a bit of a different view. I believe entirely in trans and we've certainly, um, I think, benefited from more, um, you know, measurement of not just women on boards or uh, ethnic minority people on boards, but actually looking at behind at the pipeline and being able to track at every stage. Um, also, uh, the transparency around pay that has been important, as you mentioned, David. I'm very vehemently against quotas. Um, the 30% club is obviously a target, um, and we're now at 36% actually for the FTSE, 34% for the 350 companies. And I actually think, well, how do we get there voluntarily? Um, there was this uh, pressure from public policy uh, that was it was thrown down the gauntlet. You know, if you don't do something about this, we might impose quotas. But actually, what I saw was that one by one, and it really was a case of sort of, you know, literally persuading people one by one, that actually they began to see it for themselves. And perhaps it came about through having, you know, one woman on their board who might have stopped them doing a crazy deal, um, but only tentatively raised her hand because she was only one. And really, it became very powerful that people actually believed in it. 
And so I think the danger with legislation is you end up people feeling resentful and you end up them the feeling that, oh, well, this is why the company doesn't do so well, because we've had to put people on who don't deserve to be there, even if they deserve to be there. And so I would caution, you know, it's only taken us 10 years, which sounds a long time, but to go from less than 10 percent female representation on FTSE 350 boards to 34 percent a day with no legislation, I think just shows it can be done. Well, I would add, though, I would disagree, Helen, because I think that the difference when you talk about diversity and the population is white women and African-Americans and Latinx, there is a material difference in uh, progress and the time that it takes to see the kind of transformation. And so when we talk about diversity, we have to be very clear, because I think sometimes when we say diversity, what that means to some is white women. White right. women are included, but we need to be very expansive. And what we see is, and we've seen this in higher education and other um, spheres uh, where diversity has happened, we've seen significant progress of inclusion of white women, but we have not seen uh, commensurate gains for African Americans and Latinx. Let me give you some examples, and I think the, um, you know, the California legislature took action because this was not moving at all. First, there was, uh, as you know, uh, California led the way with the first gender law, and I believe in in data and transparency. But when we took a look at who was appointed to California company boards in the first year? 78% were white women, 3.3% uh, were Latina, 6% were black, 10% were Asian. Now, this is a state that has a majority minority. In fact, uh, you combine all of the underrepresented groups, we're a majority, and Whites are, are less. Latinos are the largest demographic in the state with such low numbers. So there is a, a much more deep-seated um, view that, one, the talent doesn't exist, but second, uh, that there's, you know, we do, are, we still are contending with issues of systemic racism and what has led to, again, white privilege. Uh, one example is, you know, just our last president demonized Latinos and unleashed uh, some deep-seated racism that led to hate crimes, and hate crimes like uh, a mass shooting in El Paso. So we've got a, a lot of, uh, of societal issues that are much more complicated in the states and clearly other parts of the of the world that need that special attention and it has to be intentional because just asking for more gender diversity is not bringing in the women of color when we talk about the societal issues of course in the past year it's been clear that the pandemic has widened the inequality across all sorts of parts of society and really exposed um, the depths of inequality, um, in many cases, that lay under the surface. And it's been the, 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 uh, the worst impact, of course, on the pandemic has been on the lower paid and on minority groups as well. Uh, do we think it's thrown this effort about diversity in companies into reverse as well? Because, of course, companies have had a lot to deal with, with this huge economic shock. Um, has it meant companies are taking their eye off the ball on this question? I think it's the opposite. I, I think that the pandemic and the social unrest have laid bare the need for teams that are diverse, that can look to the future. Forward-thinking companies are taking some real action, and those are the ones that are going to succeed in the future. And I'm certainly yeah. seeing that, David. I, I am seeing, on the, I'm, I'm on three um, public company boards, and on each there is a deep commitment to diversity, and we've seen accelerated progress. And at the board table, we are having conversations about race that we never had before. Um, so I actually am seeing uh, reasons for a lot of encouragement here in the U.S. And how about in the U.K.? Yeah. 
It's, it's a mixed picture, I think. Um, certainly the data suggests that um, minorities, and I agree entirely, by the way, I'm not saying that diversity is all about white women. Um, I completely agree that that's just in the starting place and um, just because women aren't, the mi aren't a minority. But I think it's absolutely critical that we broaden beyond white women. So just to make that clear. But I think we've seen so much anxiety um, around the widening wealth uh, inequality, the widening racial inequality in terms of people uh, suffering more from the impact of coronavirus in terms of mortality and also women um, losing their job more likely than, than men or people. Followed. So I think, although I'm not, ultimately, I'm not pessimistic, because I think you're right, we are seeing companies double their efforts. And also we're seeing government, I think, being conscious of these trends. But we do need to be very, um, or avoid complacency, obviously. Uh, there is a great hope that more flexible working will arise as a result of some of the things that we've had to do during the pandemic. But it won't happen if we just sit here passively and if we just assume that everybody was, as they say, build back better. We genuinely have to take this moment as another moment to seize, like after the financial crisis. And, so and that's very interesting, to, I think. This, yeah. Sorry, Esther. Yeah. No, I was going to say, I mean, we have to bring it back to the business case. And, you know, a lot of companies have terrific diversity statements and value statements. Yet diversity, equity, and inclusion without Latinos is incomplete. We're talking about a group that is two in 10 Americans, contribute 25% of the GDP in the United States, and 83% of new entrants to the workforce are Latino. And yet the numbers in the C-suite are low, less than 2%. And in the boardrooms, it hasn't changed. It's still 2% even once we've had um, a start to, to some diversity efforts. So we're here to be a resource. We're here to be uh, part of the solution because we, again, want to take away the excuse that there, you can't find the talent. I just want to pick up on this idea then that the pandemic in some ways is an opportunity because the economy is going to be reinventing itself. We are all thinking about the future of work and how we fit our working lives around our home lives and how they've fused so much over the past year. I'm just curious for all of your thoughts around that. Uh, if we think that part of the building back process for companies is to make themselves more diverse because it's a real opportunity to make themselves more like their customers, more like the world in general, but also just that fundamentals of how you go about working. And if you have a more flexible approach in your company life, does that mean you're better suited to attract diverse talent and for diverse talent to rise to the board? I think, David, we're going to be living in a post-COVID world. We lived until recently in a before-COVID world. The PC world will be different. And the exciting thing about the next frontier is that we are going to be iterating through massive transformation transformation in what does the future of work look like? Where will we work from? Part of this transformation will be the question of diversity. Starting at the top, I think we are going to see um, organizations transformed. We're going to see boards where it used to be acceptable to have a token one or two blacks or Latinx or a woman that's not going to be acceptable anymore. And we now have the mechanisms in place to engage on these matters in an ongoing way. So I, David, am actually very encouraged and hopeful and believe that in the PC world, we will be a better, more profitable, more diverse, more sustainable world if we take seriously uh, the lessons of the last year. That's a wonderfully optimistic uh, viewpoint at the end as well. Helena, do you have something to add? Yeah, so I, I think one of the things that's held back so many people outside the sort of that narrow band that we agreed on earlier was sort of had tended to rule over things. People have been felt excluded, just they didn't, they weren't inside the club. They didn't speak the language effectively. They didn't know how to play office politics, as well as perhaps um, struggling perhaps to combine family and work if you had to work all the time at 
desk in one office. So I think all of that has been thrown up in the air. And I agree with Darren that this is a fantastic opportunity if we seize it, because clearly the, what working from home has taught so many of us is that actually, you know, it works. Be productive, we can be efficient, but also it makes companies aware they have to judge people more on results, rather their output, rather than um, say the hours spent on a particular desk or the office politics so much coming into play. So I think if we can just embrace this as part of the future of the work, plus think about the pressing economic need, we have a dire economic situation in many parts of the world now, having shut down so many of our economic um, sectors, and we have to embrace this now. This is our moment. This is our moment to actually change the way talent is recruited and developed. Thank you so much. And I, and of course, we, we, I, yes, Esther. I would Final agree. That, uh, yes, I mean, the, there's pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, and clearly we're starting to see some changes, although I, I worry that uh, we need to make sure that as we move forward together that we're actually tracking how all of our important communities are moving forward together. Because too often it gets, it, the detail is, the devil's in the detail and that's really important. And I think the second thing is, is again that um, the boardroom should reflect more of the customer and employee base to ensure there's that connectivity uh, and to ensure that there is the forward thinking company that has stakeholders and shareholders in mind. Thank you so much. And sadly, we are out of time and we could be talking about this for many hours because there is so much to unpack here. But I think a really optimistic note to end on that COVID has been an accelerator of so many things and so much change, but the idea that that could be captured somehow to accelerate this drive as well and that companies could emerge from this with truly diverse boards of the future is uh, surely a happy note to end on. So thank you so much to Helena Morrissey, to Esther Aguilera and to Darren Walker and all the best. Thank you.